Hello, Facebook and YouTube. We are streaming live here from Chicago. Welcome to Wine Cellars Wine Weekend. We are here on a Saturday. We're going to go to Spain to visit a region that has history going back to the Phoenicians um, of winemaking. So a very, very, very old wine growing area um, that has been shaped over the years by different people coming in. Um, it is not only an ancient or old, very old growing region, but it's also Spain's first denom denominación de origen calificada, which is the country's highest quality um, level for any region. It's uh, the equivalent of maybe Italy's DOCG, but in Italy, the DOCG is they hand them out like candy. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. In Spain, there's only two at this level, um, and Rioja was the first, with Priorat coming in around 2003, I believe. So very storied region, high-quality region, and we're going to visit with a high-quality producer, Carlos Ceres. Carlos Ceres is, also has great history. It will be celebrating its 125th anniversary next year, so it goes back to 1896. We're going to visit with uh, our friend John Perry. Uh, some of you may know him from uh, visits here in the United States, but he is based in Logroño, which is a city in the region. And he will be joining us tonight at 9 p.m. his time, which is two minutes ago. So let's pull him into the broadcast. And he is the export manager for Carlos Ceres and our friend, Mr. John Perry. Welcome to the show, John. Hello, thank you, Lee. I appreciate you, um, you know, for giving Carlos Serres the opportunity to participate, um, you know, through uh, your uh, social media platforms. And I look forward to, um, you know, talking a little bit about Rioja, my region, which I'm in love with, and uh, the great wines from Carlos Serres. Yeah, why don't we get a little background on you first? Uh, you have kind of, I like to say you have one foot in the USA and one foot in Rioja. Uh, yes, I have. Um, I uh, my family is a mix of people from the U.S. My father's side and people from Spain. My mother's side. So um, I'm a bit of a half breed, which, uh, let's say. And we've lived. The family has lived in both countries, so I can relate to both cultures really well. Yeah, and you were kind of born into the industry too. Your father was in the industry as well. In real, uh, yeah, my. My father was part of the industry, and I've sort of grown in a wine family. We're not vineyard or winery owners, but, um, you know, a, a family that is very passionate and very tied to wine and to Rioja. That's great. Well, let's let's get started and learn a little bit about uh, the region. I think uh, I'm a map person, so I love images. And um, we'll let's get let's pull some in here real quick. All right. Let's start with the maps. All right. All right. So where is. Um, Rioja. Yeah, let me blow us up here a little bit. Yeah, I get to uh, from the beginning. So I just like to show. I, I'm I'm also a very uh, image driven kind of human, so I enjoy these kind of pictures. But this dramatic picture will just set the tone for what we'll talk about when we get to these maps that aren't quite as vibrant. So take it away, All John. Right. So Rioja is located in uh, the north of Spain. Uh, on a river valley called the Ebro River Valley. If you think of the word Iberian Peninsula, Ebro comes from there. So it's a very important river in uh, our country. Um, Rioja is uh, a, a place that has been forged by wine, wine making and grape growing. I'm in love with the region because um, it is a great example in the landscapes. You can see how you know all the vineyards uh, together, how man has turned these landscapes into you know, something worth coming, coming to see. And like many other regions of the world, it was considered from very early uh, an ideal location for grape growing. Uh, the region is protected by mountain ranges. To the north, we have a mountain range so this is the Ebro River Valley. Yes, to the north, we have a mountain range called Sierra de Cantabria. This Sierra de Cantabria prevents a lot of the, let's say, cold climate from continental Europe and the Atlantic from coming into the region. And then we have the Sierra de la Demanda to the south, which prevents a lot of the warmer winds and climate from the Spanish Central Plateau and the Mediterranean from coming into the region. So we have sort of, it's a climatic frontier. 
between uh, the Atlantic climate and the uh, Mediterranean climate, a mild area where uh, you know grape growing is ideal. The first civilization to um, recognize this area as an important grape growing region were the Romans. They are that we have uh, archaeological remains of um, you know Roman uh, settlements all over the area. But one very important one in uh, the west, sorry, eastern part of the region called Calagurris, and another in the central part of the region called Varella. Varella was the last navigable point in the Ebro, uh, and uh, it was used as a highway for a lot of uh, products, and among them, wine. These wines were destined to uh, the two main cities in the Ebro region during Roman times, Cesar Augusta, so today's Zaragoza, and Tarraco, Tarragona. All right, so the Romans were the first ones to really discover this area and start making wines here. The yeah, next, I, um, when I when I when I was there, you know that the the Cantabrian mountain range here that we're looking at uh, prevents kind of the is is the separation to the Basque country. And when we think about Basque country, we think about cool Atlantic influence. And the, the next images, I think, really kind of show that the mountain range and how it holds back um, that influence. Yes, this is one of the vineyards that the uh, owning family, uh, the Vivanco family, has in uh, Briones. It's uh, considered the gold coast of Rioja. And there you can see the meander with the river and the mountains that are protecting. You can see the, the clouds there, that sort of cold front from coming into the region. There's an effect called Foen effect, where all of the rain happens on the other side. And then these mountains, uh, as I said, uh, protect the region. And then the, the cold front is tamed by the mountains. Now here's another close-up shot of kind of the mountains holding back. And if you go from the Atlantic coastline and you come through these mountain ranges, it's like you step through the looking glass between 50 degrees and rainy and 75 degrees and sunny. Uh, this, I love this picture because it's a great example and the first one you showed of what Rioja really is. It is so diverse. You saw all the colors here, every turn, every rolling hill, every valley, hides a medieval town with a, a, a certain type of soil and a certain you know uh, wind blowing from a certain direction and very diverse microclimates that you know uh, are just incredible they're great I'm, I'm in love with my region i'm proud of uh, representing it all right you mentioned you know we mentioned romans and medieval towns and mm -hmm. uh let's see if there's some uh we i think that leads right into the next slide here um and I think we should probably jump into the mid 19th century. Uh, great. Yes. So um, let's say modern Rioja, or, or what we call uh, Rioja, is uh, the silver lining of uh, the different plagues that affected the vineyards in Europe during the 1800s. We had a mildew plague, we had an oidium plague, and then also uh, I think the, most, the more destructive uh, of the three was the phylloxera plague. Uh, during the 18th century, we have, uh, you know, uh, let's say the consolidation of the Industrial Revolution. So uh, trade between continents, uh, you know, becomes easier and faster. Um, the story says or goes that it was a French winemaker who, um, you know, he had his vineyard ravaged by Oidium, who went to America and uh, researched a variety called Isabella that was impervious to Oidium. He brought it back to uh, France to plant, but what he didn't know that is in that shoot, he was also carrying phylloxera. Phylloxera is a louse that attacks, uh, let's say, the, the vines, suffocates them and kills them. So uh, during the mid to late 1800s, this phylloxera plague ravaged the vineyards in the, let's say, main producing, wine producing areas in Europe. So a lot of the, especially from France, French winemakers uh, from the Medoc, so from Bordeaux, uh, you know, wanted to find other places where they could source grapes. They crossed the Pyrenees, which is the mountain range that separates uh, France from Spain. Remember that Phylloxera cannot live above a certain altitude. So uh, it was sort of a barrier. And they arrived to uh, what we know today as Rioja Alta, one of the subregions in uh, Rioja, where they found a climate that was very similar and a soil that was very similar to that, that, to that, uh, soil that they had in uh, Bordeaux. So calcareous clay soils, high limestone content, uh, a river, and a sort of an Atlantic cooler influenced climate. 
um, and where they could source uh, wines and continue with their business. What they did find here in Rioja was that the wines that they were made that we were making were not apt for the let's say French market or the French palate. So they brought into the region, um, let's say, new technology, both in uh, vineyard management. Here you can see how they tried a lot of different solutions to get rid of phylloxera. What something that they brought here to Rioja was, for example, the trellis system training the vineyards and trellis. Uh, but more importantly, uh, there was a change in the wine style. They were using the varieties that were traditional to Rioja, but reflecting French uh, styles. Uh, in this case, um, also uh, regarding winemaking techniques, uh, de-stemming became something that very commonplace and aging our wines in oak. Uh, the oak aging process is what has built a classic Rioja as we know today. So the focus is on process and our regulatory council, the governing body for the region, sort of uh, certifies that our wines have been aged for a certain amount of time in barrel and in bottle. Yeah, I La Rioja, La Rioja uh, let's say, really conquered these markets, not only because um, you know, uh, there, was, there was a very, uh, there was a lack of wine in the rest of Europe, but because uh, in a very small area, you can find a very diverse, uh, you know, terroir, let's say, or different types of soils and climates, as I was saying before. The three main, yeah, the three main types of soil, excuse me, are uh, calcareous clay, alluvial rock, and a uh, ferrous clay. So calcareous clay is a yellow clay with high limestone content. Alluvial rock are those rocks that the river, through flowing uh, thousands of years, has been turning into cantos rodados and depositing in all the different manders as in all the bends. And then we have ferrous clay. This is a, a, um, sort, a type of soil that you can find in the US a lot. It's a reddish soil with high uh, sort of iron content. Uh, this red comes from uh, the iron. Uh, poor soils mainly because the vine you know, thrives in poor soils. Uh, usually uh, the, in the middle ages, for example, and before the French came, the more fertile lands were dedicated to other crops. Today, if you come to Rioja, vineyards are everywhere. Uh, we have about the size of Delaware in vineyards. So you can imagine it's, it's a pretty you know, intense area vineyard-wise. Uh, so one of these, uh, during uh, the late 1800s, um, one of the, let's say, French pioneers to come to Rioja came from Orleans, a small town in the south of France. His name was Carlos uh, Serres, and he came to, uh, you know, buy and sell wine and sort of make a fortune and um, help his partners in um, back in France. He, he came back and he, uh, you know, discovered this region that was incredible, the type of soil, the climate, uh, let's say the style of the fruit that they could grow here was, you know, ideal really to reflect those French styles and make this region into a fine wine uh, region. Carlos Serres started out in the Barrio de la Estación de Aro, which was the, as I said, the, uh, let's say, Industrial Revolution brought the railroad to Aro, and they used the railroad to uh, move the wine, uh, you know, out of the region. Uh, once his business uh, became too big for the rail station quarter, he moved, he decided to build his own winery, and uh, instead of staying, um, Oh, sorry, instead of leaving uh, back to France, when Philoxera arrived in Rioja, right in the you know uh, early 1900s, I would say right in 1900, he decided to found his winery and stay. I like to think that he fell in love with um, you know somebody from Aro and uh, decided to stay because that's what my dad, you know, that's a bit of my dad's story as well. So um, he was very convinced that uh, of the potential of the region for fine wines. And he was one of the founders of the Export Consortium. So from the very first, uh, you know, uh, years of the winery, the export, the export focus, so making wines that could sort of uh, appeal to the international palate, the, the, the gourmets out there in the world, that, that was, you know, the niche that he was after. And as you know, a way of doing this is, well, having your own vineyard and controlling the process from the very beginning. He was one of the first people to have a commercial office outside of um, Rioja. So he had one in Havana and I think one in France as well. 
So he had a son named Carlos Serres Jr., also an important figure uh, in Rioja, because he was, you know, one of the first, uh, let's say, generations to learn how to uh, wine make uh, or learn the technical side at the uh, Estación Enológica de Aro, which is Aro's like wine, ma wine making school, let's say at the time. Uh, and he was the second generation and he sort of expanded the business into Europe, um, markets like Switzerland and, uh, you know, in South America as well, but mainly Northern Europe. And then his son, um, Carlos Serres as well, sadly died, you know, when he was uh, very young, uh, 40 years old. And, um, you know, sort of, a, a, let's say the, the business died down until uh, the owners today, the Vivanco family, decided to revitalize this part of uh, Rioja's industrial heritage. And uh, the best way to do it was defending a, the style of wines that had been, you know, had made the region famous, um, you know, from the beginning. That's, that's a lot of history there. We summed up 125 years in less than five minutes. So nice job there. I think um, Thank you. that we're going to taste three wines. And I think we just earned wine number one. All right, so um, we've, uh, uh, Lee and I chose three wines um, because uh, what we want you to sort of understand here is what uh, the process means to the wine style. Now, most of these wines are Tempranillo. Tempranillo is the main grape grown in Rioja. Uh, etymologically, uh, the name comes from Temprano. Temprano means early. Because of this Atlantic influence in, uh, in Rioja Alta and in the region, um, you know, sometimes we have a cool or very, or a colder climate during the harvest. So a lot of times you will need um, a variety that ripens early. No? Temprano, late budding, but early ripening. So yeah, and something also I think the Bordelais are familiar with, which is some Atlantic influence or at least uh, questionable weather at the time of harvest. So um, something that might be uh, another parallel for us to draw with Bordeaux. So, so uh, every, Rio, yeah, every Rioja be. wine has to be certified by the Consejo. So we'll start talking about the back labels. The green back label certifies Rioja origin. It's called the Cosecha. And uh, these are wines that are in the first or second year that, uh, you know, we're trying uh, to maintain the fruitiness and the freshness of, of uh, you know, the style. Uh, in this case, all of the fruit comes from uh, the Rioja Alta subregion. And despite the fact that we do own a vineyard, uh, the fruit here uh, is sort of sourced from uh, long-standing suppliers of fruit. Uh, here in Rioja, buying grapes and growing your own is a happy coexistence, uh, as, as you know. And it's a way of sort of um, helping your neighbors, uh, who are also probably little vineyard owners who want to sell their fruit and don't have enough capital to have their own winery. And it's a way of sort of uh, you know, rural de development and helping helping each other out, a sense of uh, community, rather than just uh, financial transaction, if you know what I mean. So we control the uh, vineyards from these suppliers, our winemaking team, and they tell them when to pick, uh, you know, when to do the green pruning, et cetera, et cetera. The idea behind our Carlos Serres Tempranillo, uh, the cosecha category, is a true varietal example of Tempranillo from Rioja Alta. Um, what are the characteristics of Tempranillo? Usually red and blue forest fruit. And for me, what really defines it is the low pH, the high acidity. This high acidity is also telling us the longevity this wine is going to have, how well it's going to uh, age in oak. In and this case, also, uh, the yeah, I think it also um, leads us right into that conversation of what we're going to talk about next, which is barrel aging. And the idea behind barrel aging is because of the grape variety, the material that we're working with there. So it's terroir driven. It's it's almost not necessarily a winemaker choice. It's a choice that's deter predetermined by the grape variety and the, and the climate. Um, I, you know, I really don't like to talk about terroir in the uh, traditional sense when talking about a wine like this. I would rather talk about typicity, how it is representative of a certain style that is representative of a place, but not of a certain vineyard. It's a style. In this case, the Tempranillo has been fermented for primary fermentation in concrete. And then we're aging uh, the wine for five months in uh, oak barrels, in American oak. This is gonna give the wine some structure. We're not using very new barrels because we never want the oak tannin and the oak flavors to overpower the fruit. The idea here is to have something very fresh 
and very fruity and just very straightforward and pleasing to drink. Uh, how we occasions, how do we drink this here in Rioja? This can be your everyday little tapas wine, but usually, um, you know, I like hiking in the mountains. You see my beautiful region. And we will take a bottle of something like this. And when we stop, the best part of hiking is when you stop to have your little aperitivo. You will take the bottle, put it in the stream, get it to cool a little bit and have that refreshing, you know, something that really lifts your spirits up and not only re refreshes, you know, your, your, your mouth, let's say. Yeah. So um, medium body, medium tannin, you know, uh, just a great wine to sip. And as I said, very unpretentious. It is little, telling us. A little, too, huh? a little spice character too. Oh yeah, of course. The, um, I always say that oak, for those who don't really, you know, oak is like the spice box for the winemaker, you know. And Tempranillo also is known for having a sort of a spicy finish character, the variety. But in this case, yes, uh, as you, you know, uh, as you know, that oak character is going to give it a bit more structure, another layer, you know, and, and also shelf life. Uh, in an export context, like we're talking about, this wine is going to last longer because it's seen this process. All right. I think uh, we can take a, a quick little break and maybe say hi to some people. Uh, we have a live chat feature, so anybody watching out there, please feel free to chime in and ask John and I some questions, and we'll try to address them. Um, but I wanted to uh, bring some stuff up on the screen. John, I'm not sure. I know you know some of these people, but perhaps somebody from Spain saying hola. Hola, Rafael. Muchas gracias por uh, uh, estar con nosotros. Y otra gente aquí. Hola, Virginia. Gracias. And then we, we all know this guy. Oh, Brandon. My brother, good to see you. And friend of mine here from Massachusetts. So Kathy, thank you for joining us. Keep the questions coming and um, we'll uh, move on and taste the wines. Obviously, um, there's a lot of wines here. Three wines may be more than we want to open, but this recording will be there for you to come back to and open up each bottle and maybe review it when we get to it. And I think we're getting pretty close to getting to the next wine, but let's jump back into the presentation real quick and show some other things that will lead us into maybe the crianza and what that means. So I'm going to pull this guy back up. And we will jump down here. We talked about Tempranillo, maybe some of its, uh, some of its uh, flavor profile and, and the wines that it produces. We touched upon this real quick, and I think that... Uh, you know, I'll let you take it from here and, and lead the discussion into uh, maybe a little bit about what these what these categories mean, and we'll taste the the crianza and reserva when we get to those. All right. So this tasting is a great example of the versatility of a grape like Tempranillo. It can produce wines that are very light and refreshing. Uh, for you know, those of you who like Pinot Noir, for example, they can they can produce wines that are very similar. But it can also produce wines that are very hearty and uh, have a lot more tonicity, body, and complexity. And a little bit, uh, I think this classification is guiding us, telling us, you know, what we're going to find in the bottle. Not only telling us how long each of these wines has been aged in oak, but also, you know, what you're going to find inside. Um, the next, uh, let's say, category in the Rioja aging classification is called Crianza. Crianza, we can translate as a wine that has been aged or nursed, let's say nursed in oak. Um, it's usually a wine that is in its third year and that spends a minimum of one year in the barrel before release. Keep in mind that Carlos Serres was founded in 1896. So we were there before these rules were really written. The uh, Regulatory Council uh, dates from the 1920s, 1925. So they base their rules on the producers that had been successful with uh, these styles. You know? So we are exceeding the, minim the minimum aging times in every single category. So uh, for example, our young wine sees five or six months aging in oak, depending on, on the vintage. And our crianza is going to see uh, more than the minimum. So the minimum is 12 months. We are going to I'll uh, age it for 14 months in a combination of American and French oak. We can get into what each of these brings into the equation later. Uh, mainly American oak. Um, and uh, then once blended and bottled, we sell the bottle for six months before release into the market. This is going to ensure that the wine you know, is uh, stable and uh, let's say rounder. Uh, and why cork is so important. So if you noticed, we have a screw cap here. And this is because the, the idea behind this wine is um, 
easy consumption, you know, very easy to open, etc. And we wanted to maintain the freshness and the fruitiness. Uh, in the rest of the categories, we're going to, to see cork. And cork is very important to let the wine breathe and uh, let's say build other aromas during the bo bottle aging. So let's start, uh, open up the Crianza while I talk. Crianza would be that wine that is the crowd pleaser. So uh, Lee has been to Rioja with me. And, uh, you know, you go out for tapas in Spain. We love socializing. We love to be out in the bars in the plaza, you know, talking to people and uh, having fun and touching uh, each other, which is something that is not very politically correct at the moment with the virus, but we love it. So this is now, that wine that is... Spain stays in Spain, John. I'm sorry? What happens in Spain stays in Spain. Oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that Crianza is going to be that crowd pleaser, that wine that, uh, you know, is going to sort of be the staple of a lot of the wineries uh, here in, in the region. The idea behind a Crianza, we need a wine that has medium body and medium tannin. So it's a wine to pair with food. Uh, we need a wine that has medium body and medium tannin, so it won't overpower the food. And at the same time, bright acidity to sort of get you salivating and cleaning your palate. It can never overpower the food, sorry, but it, it has to stand up to it as well. So it's going to have some character. Uh, here, the idea is balance between fruit and oak. You'll see how that oak aging uh, really gives the wine, you know, tames a little bit of that tenacity and uh, just gives it more layers and it's, uh, you know, makes it more attractive and more beautiful. The color, we didn't talk about the color before. In the young wines, you'll see very purple rims. And here you'll start seeing more towards a ruby red, a sort of nice bright cherry. Um, which denotes that it's seen some aging in, in oak. For me, the nose, when I when I smell a crianza, I'm a, I'm a very big emotion guy, right? So when I smell crianza, I see myself, I close my eyes and I'm there at the bar having my little pincho. You know, I love it. Yeah, it has for well, me um, a lot of that cedary note, but also that very noble typical, wood, yeah. that typical dill note that people note. Um, so I get a lot of that, uh, and then maybe even that, that touch of coconut that people are looking for and other kernel type notes. Mm -hmm. But there's still um, the balance between that fruit um, with the oak, that integration is, is still, I smell the oak, but I taste the fruit up front and then the two kind of meld together in the finish. That's exactly, that's the idea. The idea is to have this uh, beautiful balance between fruit and oak. Uh, if you really notice what, it's, what the oak has done to the Tempranillo, it's tamed it, and it's also made it, let's say, um, rounder and more balanced by adding sort of a sweet tenacity to it. We have a little bit of also cinnamon, you know, and nutmeg in there. A little vanilla, and too. Eso is vanilla. And this is what makes sort of that balance. This is why American oak really works so well with, uh, you know, Tempranillo from uh, Rioja. Yeah, American uh, oak known for giving slightly sweeter characters, which will help temper that Tempranillo with its high pH um, and kind of aggressive nature. So uh, that's the that's the logical marriage there. And it also refines the tannins. What I love about classic Rioja or this sort of more modern take on this classic Rioja is the finesse of the wines, the elegance, the silky, the silky tannin, very fine. You know, I love it. I, I'm already getting hungry. <laughs> and you, you guys can go out now, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, now we're, uh, let's say the state of alarm has been lifted uh, and people were really eager to go out. So I'm, I'm, you know, a lot of people are also very scared because uh, suddenly it, it's like there's no virus when really, you know, it's just you have a room in the hospital. You have a bed if, if you get it, basically. Yeah. Well, uh, I look forward to coming back and, and or you coming here or both and, and um uh, drinking together but let's let's go back to the winery we've got some cool images that i think people might be interested in in terms of production yeah. yes well let's talk a little exactly let's talk a little bit about the process because uh here we start seeing that a percentage of the fruit comes from um you know our our own vineyard finca el estanque this is an idea that sort of clashes with traditional rioja uh very rarely have uh, you know the big companies in Rioja owned vineyards. Uh, their business is more buying grapes and vinifying them and aging them, etc. cetera. Uh, partly because our history is a blending history of uh, grapes grown in the three different zones uh, that are, you know, so usually if we have a very cold 
harvest, let's say, or very cold year, all the wineries would flock to the Mediterranean area where the fruit had better ripeness and quality. And if we had, let's say, a warmer year, traditionally the fruit in the eastern part would be a little bit more overripe. Uh, and everybody would be buying grapes from uh, the higher, cooler parts. Yeah. So in this we'll case, go back to that. yeah. In we'll this case, Carlos Serres. Yeah, that's where Ado is. So uh, up there, where you can see. Yep. Uh, so in the higher west, elevation, cooler, mm -hmm. northwestern lower. part of the region, exactly. Yeah. All right. So uh, in this way, Carlos Serres is very unique for a uh, you know a producer that was always centered on having their own vineyard, and in the town of Ado, it's about a hundred meters from. Uh, the winery, and it was sort of originally planted, I guess, a long time ago, but let's say replanted in the year uh, 1980, starting in the year 1980, with uh, the varieties that are traditional to the region. Most of uh, the vineyard is dedicated to Tempranillo, our noble grape, the backbone of all of our wines. And then we also plant Graciano Mazuelo, which are the wines that we blend into um, our Reserva and Gran Reserva wine, uh, sorry, categories and Maturana Tinta. Maturana Tinta is a variety that uh, Rafael Vivanco, one of the owners, um, you know, really helped uh, bring back from almost oblivion. I think there were, he was telling me there were only 50 vines left when they started uh, studying it. And uh, it's a wine, or sorry, it's a grape that's very unique to, to our region. So what makes uh, Finca Lestanque unique? So uh, as you know, we can talk about soil, location, and terroir or sorry, soil, location, climate. So uh, located in the Atlantic part of the region, so the cooler part of the region, uh, it shows a mix in the soil of two of the soils that we find. So mainly calcareous clay, but it also has some alluvial rock mixed in there. And this is important to aerate the root systems and to sort of have some more, um, let's say, heat retention. Um, and of course, uh, you know, um, we're getting pretty low yields here in uh, Finca Lestanque. It's uh, farmed sustainably. So maximum yields in Rioja per hectare uh, are 6,500 kilos. Um, you know, a hectare is 2.3 acres. So, um, you know, less than three tons per acre is what we're getting at uh, Finca El Estanque. Everything is hand harvested. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just saying very low yields relative, yeah. to, uh, relative to the rest of the wine industry. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no, of course, if we're not going to talk about, you know, the New World or other regions here in Spain, but this is a low yielding winery, you know, they're 38 year old vines and, uh, you know, you're not going to get these high productive clones that a lot of, sadly, a lot of people have planted um, out uh, here, even in, in Rioja, All right? So ideal location. And what I really love is the philosophy of vineyard management, um, you know, that has always been a, an integral part of uh, the wines. Uh, made by Carlos Serres. Um, you know, sustainable viticulture, so minimal tillage, as you can see. We foster native cover cover crops. We don't use herbicides. We don't use pesticides. We want the vineyard to be, the uh, let's say, a natural ecosystem uh, for all types of microorganisms, which is, uh, let's say, the definition of a healthy vineyard. Yeah, we it's talk just a lot like, about biodiversity uh, in, in a lot of these uh, a lot of these conversations about quality production, and we know quality production starts with good vineyards, and good vineyards, uh, a good definition there is biodiversity. Uh, for me, sometimes, you know, when I, we talk about these microorganisms, I think about the, you know, vegetation in our stomach. Sometimes when you're very, you know, sick, you lose that sort of vegetation in the stomach or, you know, all that bacteria that you have there, and you're not feeling very well. So this is the same thing for, the vineyard. The vineyard needs to be a live environment and the healthier the vineyard is, you know, the better fruit you're going to get and the better fruit equals better wine. Uh, it was one of the things that I laughed about, uh, you know, we've been in touch, of course, with all of our uh, vineyard managers and everything. And I asked them, you know, what's going on? And he said, well, we're having a lot of the animals, so a lot of the fauna, you know, coming into the, into the vineyard, something that you usually don't see. Everybody's been confined at home. So now the animals are a little bit, you know, all over. So we have, uh, you know, uh, deer, rabbits, uh, wild boar. All right. So coming back, uh, you know, control of the fruit is very important. At Carlos Serres, we hand harvest all of our all of our vines into small crates. Think eight kilos, eight ten kilos in every crate. These crates come to the winery and they undergo a second selection first by grape bunch and then by individual berry. 
after uh, only those, uh, let's say, only that fruit that is in perfect sanitary and ripeness conditions goes into the next phase of vinification, which would be uh, maceration and uh, primary fermentation. Uh, in Carlos Serres, we use concrete vats. Concrete is very important because it allows temperature control, just like stainless steel. And also it's a porous material, so it allows oxygen exchange. The yeasts need oxygen to sort of uh, turn the fructose into alcohol. And um, also doesn't bring in, let's say the negative things, or you know, doesn't cover the fruit like an oak vat would. And you don't have to add as much, let's say extra oxygen as you would in the very closed environment of stainless steel. In a sense, it's a st stylistic decision because it maintains the freshness and the fruitiness of the of uh, the varieties. And at the same time, gives it a bit of that minerality, which, or uh, let's say, defends the minerality that we get from the soil. So. Yeah, totally neutral fermentation. So you're preserving what's there rather than altering it. Exactly. Uh, um, after primary fermentation, uh, the wines uh, are aged and vinified. Sorry, the grapes are aged and vinified separately, each of the plots. And we're uh, using uh, American and French oak. All of the barrels have to be Bordelais sized barrels, so 53 gallon to be official or to have that time count. Uh, and we have about 6,000 of them uh, in the winery. Average share of the winery between four, uh, age of the barrels is between four and five years. We never want to use a lot of new oak because it's a way sometimes of masking a lot of the character uh, that makes Carlos Serres what it really is. So this is our first aged wine, that Crianza that sees 14 months in oak. And we have that great, beautiful balance. Hey John, this might be a good opportunity. We were talking um, earlier this week, and we were, you know, we're at the beginning of the vegetative cycle. Um, and sometimes, depending on where we are, we worry about frost. We also worry about other climatic conditions when the when the shoots are just coming out and the vines are very tender, which is hail. And apparently, you guys had a little bit of hail recently. You want to talk to what the growing season's given you so far, and maybe oh, watch that video too. All right, so um, a lot of times uh, we're asked what defines you know, a good harvest uh, in, in Rioja. Uh, part of Rioja's success is the fact that our wines are very consistent because of this tradition of blending from the different subregions. But once you start using uh, you know, fruit from your own vineyard, you really have to you know, take care of uh, every single aspect uh, surrounding um, you know, the, the, per the process. Um, what's happening lately here? So in our tradition, uh, you know, we owe a lot to tradition. So the varieties that are here are those that were identified by our forefathers as being the ones that had best adapted here and be better thrived and, you know, made the better wines. Uh, and then, of course, you have um, experience. So they write down, you know, so from experience, um, now in the spring, uh, we need a mild spring, not very hot. and uh, not very cold so we don't need frosts what's happened this year it's that we've had hail so hail is very common uh you know uh, in co cooler years here in our region and the other day i was talking to the vineyard manager and he sent me a little video right now we're in the moment that we can call flowering where you start be begin to see uh the little buds that are going to become uh you know the grape bunches let's say. yeah let's so, take a look at the video while you describe what's going on here so uh, the moment where, where we are now is, uh, you know, sort of a green pruning. It's called espergura, where you're deciding what, uh, you know, the future of each of these flowers. So some of them are better positioned and you are sort of controlling uh, yield in a way. So there we have those little flowers. That's going to become a great, uh, great bunch. As you can see, we had hail. So there's been some damage. There's been some, you know, damage to the leaves and to some of the canes. And this is when you would decide which one you have to take off and which one you're going to leave and allow it to thrive. So it's a way of also controlling yield and ensuring that you have, so there you see some damage on the leaves and some of the broken canes. And of course the floor is uh, wet, as you can see, we say that clay uh, retains uh, water or doesn't retain a lot of water, but you know, you can see a lot of puddles and it does get, you know, but. It's a low 
water retaining soil, which is important. Hydric stress in the end is something that is going to give you also better better uh, quality. So yeah, and the next problem that we're going to uh, sort of uh, have to solve uh, from the vineyard perspective is going to be the you know people that are going to have to come and do that espergura and help us uh, do that. In a way, they were saying that it's positive because we see the market environment uh, in for wine in the future as uh, there's going to be a bit, little bit of oversupply. So in this this way, a lot of the people that are only looking for volume and you know are going to lose a lot of the of those little flowers right now. So um, there's going there might you know be a shorter uh, vintage. We'll see. It's still early anyway. Yeah, still early. And how widespread was the hail? Did it hit Rioja Alta solo? Did it hit or? Uh, Rioja Alta and Alavesa. So quite a bit of uh, the the area was hit by hail and lowering yields overall, not just Finca El Estanque. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I was saying that in a way, you know, uh, silver lining again. If Rioja is the silver lining of the Philoxera plague, we always have to be lo uh, looking for silver linings in the things that happen. And in this case, this is the silver lining. It might mean less production, you know, overall. Put us back into a little bit of supply and demand balance. There we go. All right. Um, let's taste some Reserva. All right. So um, we're finishing our tasting today with what I consider to be the flagship of uh, the Carlos Arres winery. And this would be the Reserva category. This is the first wine that, um, uh, you know, is sourced 100% from Finca El Estanque. It is a blend of two varieties, Tempranillo and Graciano. Each of them is vinified separately, as I explained before, hand harvested uh, with a double selection process uh, by hand at the table, a primary fermentation in concrete, and uh, aged in oak. Reserva as a category uh, is a three or four year old wine that spends a minimum of uh, one year in oak and six months in the bottle. Uh, for us, we are exceeding this minimum aging time and we're going two years in oak and a minimum of one year in the bottle before release. Yeah, As you are going to see uh, or going to notice when you're tasting this wine, now this is when Rioja starts getting a little bit more serious. These wines, uh, because they spend more time in oak and they have a longer bottle aging time, are going to present a lot more layers and they're going to be a little bit more of an excuse for a conversation. So why, um, why are we blending two different grapes? All right, so Tempranillo is going to be the backbone of this wine. And then we have this other variety, as I said, the noble grape in Rioja is Tempranillo. We have another variety that's uh, native here to Rioja called Graciano. Graciano, uh, let's say, is a grape that is going to bring into the equation uh, more acidity, so it can give the wine more longevity, and I think also a little bit more tonicity and body. And why do we need a little bit more of that tonicity and body? Because this is a wine that is going to uh, see a very long aging. Uh, 24 months in oak, so two years in oak with racking every six months. And then once blended and bottled, uh, one year in the bottle before release. So what happens inside of the barrel? Apart from imparting uh, flavors, like we were saying before, and aromas like vinylin, uh, eugenol, you know, a lot of different compounds and, and aromas, there's also a process that happens inside called polymerization. So tannins and anthocyanins form larger change, polymers, and uh, there's sort of a chemical process that happens inside, and this is going to reflect uh, really well on this wines on these ones. And also there's a micro oxidation happening through cork, through the bottle aging. So this micro oxidation is going to give us a little bit of more tertiary aromas. Think of eating an apple, the, white, the meat is white, this oxidation turns it brown and it tastes different. Same thing is, ha is happening to the wine, you know, at, 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 through the air that seeps through the cork. All right, yeah. so uh, coming back to the wine, the color, a lot more evolved, so we're looking more at sort of a brick red, but still, what I love about Carlos Serres is that the wines are so brilliant. The color is just beautiful. You know, they're very clear, very, you know, transparent. There's no, nothing floating around. I mean, you know, very well-made wines, you can tell. The nose in this case, uh, again, it brings me back to Rioja. We can say that the young wine is that, that like uh, that little first kiss that you get that is going to tell you the potential of where you can go. The crianza would be that every day, you know, um, 
wine, something very comfortable that brings you back. And the Reserva now, we're starting to talk about other different things. Riper fruit, more tenacity, and, uh, uh, but again, a very soft tannin, a very elegant tannin, more weight, uh, more spices. Um, you know, it's just more going on in the bottle in general. The term Reserva means reserved. So it means, you know, it sort of talks about the wine has been kept a little bit longer in the winery rather than releasing quicker. For me, this classification, these three wines that we're tasting are great examples of what we call primary, secondary, and tertiary characteristics. What we call primary characteristics is what we get from the grapes themselves. So that first wine was very fruity and forward, um, and you got you tasted the grape, the grape variety. That's primary. Secondary is what the winemaker will do uh, to the wine. So barrel aging is an example, and the Crianza is a great example of that secondary characteristics that the winemaker imparts and tertiary characteristics is what develops over time. And here we're getting much more complex and different flavors, more savory characters, deeper flavors, um, and kind of broader spectrum of flavors that aren't there on either one of those wines because of the aging. So great examples of primary, secondary, and tertiary flavors and aromas. Mm -hmm. And this wine, you know, you, you just um, taste it and it's calling for food. You want, you know, something nice big juicy we're talking um you know it can stand up to uh you know aged cheese a blue cheese a nice steak like a barbecue steak i mean th th this wine is really another cl crowd pleaser but you know for a special occasion and uh, if you want to talk about you know you, you're familiar with our portfolio and the wines that we make if you want to talk about wine epiphanies and excuse for a conversation you know we can leave the gran reserva for another hour uh another wednesday Absolutely. And my my favorite pairing, I mean, we're, we're, we're Americans that most of us watching here and we like, uh, and Memorial Day is coming up. So we like stuff off uh, the barbecue. So grilled steak. My uh, favorite pairing, I bought a smoker last year and um, I, my favorite pairing is the Grand Reserva with, with smoked meats um, oh, yeah. and barbecue, smoked mm -hmm. pork, basically pork shoulder. So we have a question from uh, one of our friends. Actually, we've got a few yeah. questions. So let's take some questions. Right. Here. Let's get on um, get it. You know this guy, Jim Stover's drinking in his car. Yeah. Again. He says, what pinchos would go with the crianza? Okay, so a very typical, uh, you know, as I said, very uh, versatile uh, wine to combine with a lot of different types of food. What do we have, uh, you know, uh, here in uh, Rioja? Usually we, we can have um, patatas bravas. Uh, usually I would say more hors d'oeuvres, like uh, cold cuts, uh, you know, chorizo. Uh, uh, cured meats, uh, manchego cheese. I mean, it really, really works really well. Even, you know, poultry, spaghetti, pizza, being Americans, you know, all of that works really well. Even fried chicken. Cool. Let's um, keep going with a couple questions. And um, our I know Jim knows the pinchos, so I would, I, I would recommend to him El Champi, which is our uh, portobello mushroom with a garlic sauce and the shrimp. Sort of uh, everything a la plancha, so you know, like on a grill. Gr well, plancha would be more of the you know uh, skillet sort of. Oh, okay. Um, let's talk about uh, a question we have from our friend Kathy in Massachusetts in Brookline, my old building, in fact. Uh, Kathy asks, "Could you tell us a little about about the 2010 and the 2012 Reserva?" All right, so. Uh, 200 and, or sorry, 210, sorry. 2010 was probably, uh, you know, one of the best vintages that we've had uh, in the second decade of the 21st century. Uh, when we talk about, uh, sorry, uh, excellent or very good vintages, 2001, 2004, 2005, uh, 2010, uh, usually what I find in the wines from Otto is that these, um, Wines have more longevity when it's a uh, cooler year, let's say. Uh, 2012, if you notice, has a, or from what I remember, I'm drinking the 14 right now, but it was a warmer year. So you're going to find a lot more body, a little bit more concentration, a little bit more roundness, exactly. 2010, for me, a good rule of thumb for Rioja is uh, never exceed uh, doubling the time that we've cellared it in, in the winery ourselves. So a Crianza is a three-year-old wine. You can keep it for six years. You know, Reserva, four, five-year-old wine, 10 years is good, but that's the limit, more or less. And Gran Reservas are the only category that sort of 
uh, can withstand long periods of aging. I mean, I've heard of uh, wines from the 1800s uh, in some of the Cementerio de Bodegas and some of the old, very old cellars here are still there. Uh, the beauty about Rioja is that, uh, you know, our consistency, really vintage after vintage, how these wines really are, uh, you know, un valor seguro, we say in Spanish, something that you know that is going to be there and it's going to always more or less taste the same and it's going to deliver. And delivering, yeah. exactly, and delivering uh, wines with this aging and of this quality at the price points that Rioja can do it is something very, very difficult. Anyway, I love people that um, collect wine. It's you know one of my things to do as well. But I always say, you know, drink it and buy another bottle because the beauty of Rioja is that if you want a ten-year-old bottle, you can find it in the store. Yeah, that Grand Reserva. Um, you know, we're not tasting it today, but it's definitely it's so affordable compared to the category and and the the wine is. We I find when I go out and I buy wines. So I love, for instance, I love uh, Chianti Classico and wines from Tuscany, but these wines, they're released, I'm buying 2017 vintage, and I think the wines will will improve with age and peak five, seven years down the line, and I'm forced to drink them now. Here, you've got the option to have somebody already pre-age these wines for you so that they're in perfect drinking condition, and at the Grand Reserve level, we're charging in Carlos Ceres, it's like 25, 28, certainly less than $30 retail, for a wine that you would have had to kept in your own cellar and tried not to drink yourself in the car. Right, Jim? <laughs> so um, let's hit a couple um, more things. I think we have uh, a couple more images that I wanted to share. Um, yeah, what, what I really, as I said, what I really love about Carlos Serres and about uh, traditional or classic Rioja like, like this is how it speaks of my region, of how it speaks of where the grapes were grown, it speaks of a tradition, tradition. It speaks of the people that picked the grapes and made it and made it and of our you know history. And it really reflects the region as a whole rather than a certain location, which we are doing in Carlos Serres. And another thing that I really love about that is that we control the process from grape to glass. And that, that's really great. The um, I was I was on a Zoom call yesterday and I was talking about wine and what makes wine. They were talking about do I like it? And I, I think that's obviously important. If you don't like it, don't drink it. Oh, but clearly. If I don't necessarily have to like a wine, and I'm not to saying recognize like wines to to recognize that it speaks of a place, and that to me is what's unique about it. So. Um, if wine tastes like Coca-Cola and it could be made anywhere, there's nothing special about it. I like that identity. And if I can't taste identity in a wine, then I don't see the uniqueness or it's not interesting to me. It becomes a commodity. We are, you know, we are um, similar souls. Lee. I always look for personality as well. Sadly, in this industry, some a lot uh, the evo it's evolving a little bit towards uh, juice that almost is the same from everywhere and tastes you know trying to cater to certain palates that are going to make you a commercial success and sadly those wines might be a success now but I don't think they're going to be you know here hundred a hundred and twenty five years from now like uh, you know we're talking about Carlos Serres today. Yeah, I think we've seen here in the U.S., I feel like, and maybe it's just because I'm the tip of the iceberg in the wine industry, but I feel like there's been a movement towards more authenticity. There will always be commodities out there and there will always be fill in the blank wine at $8 that tastes like an $8 wine. But I think that the natural wine movement is an example of us moving back towards authenticity. And maybe they've overcompensated a little bit. Maybe they haven't. But you need to pull people very far left in order for them to find center sometimes. Mm -hmm. so, Agreed. Um, yeah. Um, the, another cool thing I wanted to kind of like show us is that you guys at Carlos Harris have a, have a beautiful winery. We saw some images of it. Um, let's show a couple more images of what's in there. And when I visited... Um, it was uh, it was really pretty interesting for me to hear Rafa Vivanco apologize for the cleanliness of his winery, but it was the most pristine environment, most pristine winery I've ever seen in my life, um, which is amazing. So it's a traditional producer producing wines in a traditional style with total sanitation, hygienic, clean, modern winemaking. Um, 
techniques. So it has this great purity to these traditional wines, and it really shows clearly, I think, in the finished product that we're tasting here today. Um, but here's here's you welcoming us into the winery. So you have a tasting room. Tell us a little bit about the tasting room and maybe the other things that once we're uh, out of lockdown that we can come visit uh, with you besides, obviously, uh, tasting wines in Lagronio and doing tapas crawlers, but the winery and maybe the museum too. Mm -hmm. All right, yes. So uh, first of all, regarding the cleanliness, um, as I said before, I'm very proud of, uh, you know, working for people that are so passionate and want to give back to wine and to the region so much, you know. Um, the Vivanco family, uh, the way they've revitalized Serres uh, and the way they, have, they haven't they have sold out, let's say, this her uh, industrial her heritage of the region <clears throat> and are defending uh, the classic style from, from Rioja, I think is really commendable. Uh, this doesn't mean that you're not paying attention to uh, all of the new technology and all of the new processes that you know happen every day in wine. We, what we're trying to do is the, make the best wine that we can uh, that is representative of where we're from and of our um, you know, region, history, tradition, and uh, of the varieties and, and our location in our Finca El Estanque. Yeah, and the style uh, you're looking to produce. Uh, I, I will tell you uh, that the level of commitment of this family to the region reaches uh, the fact, or let's say the level of building the largest wine culture museum that is privately owned in the world. And I'm talking about a world-class destination where you can see archeological pieces, uh, you know, um, research uh, wine, uh, incredible art from, you know, I mean, it's, it's really an ethnographic collection that is out of this world. And I think the largest uh, corkscrew collection on display in the world. 10,000 so The place is really a celebration of wine. Yeah, what is it, about 10,000 corkscrews that I saw oh, that time? I would say more. More? Yeah. And then uh, he was, uh, you know, it was collected over the years by the Vivanco family. And the Vivanco family traveled the places, and I, we talked about Roman ruins. But some of the largest, it, the, the presses are so big; oh, they're yeah. they're Roman presses, and they are so big that you had to. They're in like three stories high. Some of these things. Well, the beauty of, of uh, the museum is that you can go as deep as you want. If you really want to, you know, research something, there's the possibility to do it. If you just want to walk around the vineyard and enjoy our little slice of paradise that we have here in Rioja, you can also do it because the location is absolutely amazing. You know, every little detail is on point. Uh, you know, the wines that Rafa makes uh, with, uh, you know, uh, Vivanco and, and these wines as well, very different, but very representative of what they want to, to, to do and very pure. You know, sometimes you, you can't differentiate wines from the place they come from and he knows how to do that very very well let's take a couple questions before we wrap up here today um Great. let's see let's we got somebody agreeing with us about the grand reserve as a steal everything well, thank you does drinks way above its price point though thank you pj pure wine cafe i love you guys <laughs> they're nice supporters of wine cellars and certainly of carlos serres so thanks for all PJ. the uh, he actually uh, uh coming back to jim's uh question he uh, prepared uh, a chorizo flatbread to pair with our wines when we did the tasting that, you know, I was salivating just seeing people eating it on, you know, online like this. And then we've got our favorite wine cellars wine groupie from Texas, Lucy, who seems to be on a lot of our calls. She says, can't wait to try your rosé. It's a beautiful color. Well, thank you. Uh, rosé is, um, you know, something that... Um, what we try to do is, again, very unpretentious, very fresh, very fruity, just a very fun wine. But again, uh, you know, quality uh, and uh, let's say a very gastronomic wine in a sense that it has the acidity and the weight to also be, uh, you know, paired with food very e easily. During the Pure Wine Cafe tasting, we had an artichoke uh, sort of like little side dish and rosé. Artichoke is very, very hard to pair with wine. And that rosé worked excellent with the artichoke. So if you're looking for some strange pairing or a different flavor, please go for that because it was really good. 
Yeah, and the um, the rosé is line priced with the uh, the old vine tempranillo, which is twelve thirteen dollars or so. And also at that same level, you make a white with uh, viura and tempranillo blanco, which is a mutated version of the tempranillo red version that we've seen that happened in the '60s. Is it? Uh, no, uh, 1988. It 1988, was much more recent. So we found a mutated version of tempranillo that came up white grapes. And uh, kind of a fun twist into it. For me, it brings a, a kind of a, a very almost Sauvignon blanc kind of aromatic profile to the Viura. And maybe maybe a little bit more weight. And the Viura gives it the yeah. backbone. So it's an and, 85% you know, yeah. Viura. And personality. Yeah. And personality. So a, a, another fun, unique wine to try from you guys. Yeah, in this sense, uh, Rafa, you know, this is why I really love the, uh, the, both of their uh, main projects. He really pushes the envelope with Vivanco. So he has a single variety wines from very obscure or very native varieties, you know? Um, and at the same time, he is defending the traditional style and what made Rioja, what, what, you know, what we are today um, and doing both things really well. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just proud to, to be, to be a part of it. Yeah. The traditional, which is what we're talking about here. And then the kind of cutting edge and even sparkling wines and changing the rosé style and, and kind of at the forefront of leading the charge in, in a region that goes back so far with so much tradition and the Consejo Regulador, which is uh, a little static, shall we say? Well, it's very hard uh, for a region this important and this big. It's like a very big boat. You know, you're not in a very small boat where you can change course very quickly. There's a lot of different interests. There's a lot of, you know, I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but, you know, where there's uh, money and there's money to be made, there's always different interests. And I'm happy because I think that, you know, at least we all try to row in the same direction, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, problems going on and it's very hard a lot of times to get everybody to agree to change direction. Yeah, so and, once you, and once you agree, it does, you just don't turn the wheel and, and it, you know, go that way. You, it takes a long time to, you know, to change course and not, you know, why would you stop doing what has made you a commercial success? Crianza, Reserva, and Gran Reserva are always going to exist. They're always going to be there. Well, here's a great question from Keith, who's uh, our wine cellar's man in Houston. He's, he's my favorite guy in Texas. <laughs> Don't tell Jay Alvis that. <laughs> oh, you know, Jay so, yeah. is Texas. Jay is Texas. Yeah, all right. You're, Keith is your favorite guy in Houston. All right. Oh, there Keith we go. asks, what's next for Carlos Serres? And Keith should know better that the Consejo Regulador will never allow cans, boxes, or... Exactly. That's, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Rioja is one of the highest regulated winemaking environments in the world. And we have rules for absolutely everything. I mean, it already took us a long time to introduce a concept like a screw cap. So uh, I'm, I don't think uh, there's going to be... We're going to be seeing cans or kegs or, uh, you know, bag in box from Rioja anytime soon. You can find other places in Spain that maybe are more you know, different than Rioja. For us, selling in bottle is a, a way to add value and to control uh, you know, what we're selling. So, um, Yeah, there's a lot of wine regions out there. For instance, uh, wine sellers would love to sell kegged Prosecco, but we can't sell kegged Prosecco because the, DO, the DOC there doesn't allow that format. Exactly. So there are rules, 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 rules. And if you did want to produce uh, wine in a, in a format that wasn't approved, you would go to uh, Vino de España or something like that. Vino, yeah, de, Vino, yeah, Vino de la Tierra. You know, the, um, the Vivanco family, four generations of grape growers and winemakers. You know, if, if you need anything more or less from, from Rioja and from, you know, in wine from Spain, I think they are great people to know because very knowledgeable, very passionate, and with, you know, enough, let's say, muscle to find whatever is needed. Yeah, we were just making fun of uh, Keith. He he knows better. He's he's just uh, trying to raise some good points. I know, you. I know, he, I know. He can see that I've, it, I'm I'm on my fourth glass of wine, and he's trying to see if I'm he's going to stir in the pot. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, we've got some people joining us from the UK. We thank everybody that came and tasted. Thank you. Friends from España, people from Texas, and all over the U.S. So. Um, we appreciate you spending some time with us here on this uh, Saturday night. Um, I wanted to, uh, before we depart, I wanted to just remind everybody that might be viewing that we are back on Wine Cellars Wine Wednesday, 
we'll stay in the Iberian Peninsula and taste some wines from Portugal, some Vino Verde uh, from a producer called Faisal. So join us on Wednesday. We'll also be back next weekend with another European producer on uh, Saturday. We'll uh, take a trip to, uh, we'll actually stay in Spain. We'll go down to the Penedes region and taste some cava next Saturday. So um, Join us again for Wine Cellars Wine Wednesday, Wine Cellars Wine Weekend. And tonight, um, I wish you, John, at 10 o'clock this evening, um, continued health. And Thank you, Lee. Look forward to uh, seeing you in the museum or in the wine uh, in the in the wine tasting room there at Carlos Ceres, or maybe this side of the Atlantic. Uh, well, thank you. I just wanted to take this little last minute to uh, thank uh, Wine Cellars. You guys are very valued partners, you know, at every level of our organization. And uh, we just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to, you know, uh, use this platform, uh, use all of your followers and, uh, you know, to uh, sort of talk about our wines and sort of make new wine friends. So we're very thankful. We appreciate it very much. Yeah. And we'll be here in perpetuity and recorded on Facebook and YouTube. So. Cheers, Salud. John. Salud Thanks. to everyone, and you know, stay safe, and we hope everything comes back to normal soon. To silver linings again. To silver linings. Cheers, John. Cheers, Lee. Thank you.